Wildcat News Update, the Charter Commission jumps right into business with their first official meeting, appointing positions and planning for East Long Meadows' future. We also take a look into the old Brown Farm property. With rumors floating around, Wildcat sits down with Rep Director Colin Drury to catch up on the latest. In sports, we have several games to cover along with exciting news about the East Long Meadows girls lacrosse team. We find out what player is named Mass Live's number one top scorer in Western Mass. Those stories and much more just ahead on Alcat News Update. Good evening, I'm Ali Kearney. And I'm Rebecca Green. We begin tonight with the latest from the newly elected Charter Commission. The committee wrapped up their first meeting this past week. You may recall during last month's town election, voters approved the Charter Commission and cast ballots for the nine open spots to form the actual committee. The commission is created to look into alternate forms of town government. Tom Florence, town clerk, directed the committee's first official meeting. The nine new committee members are Ralph Page, George Kingston, Russ Denver, Eric Madison, Bill Fonseca, Larry Levine, Don Starks, Ray Miller, and Tom O'Connor their first order of business to appoint a chair and vice chair. The Charter Commission has to, at their first meeting tonight, they have to uh, appoint a chair, a vice chair, and a, or, and a recording secretary. Make a motion to nominate Don Starks to be chair. I second that. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Congratulations. There you go. Congratulations. Okay. I'd make a motion then for vice chair for Mr. Levine. I will second that. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank Congratulations. You. Thank you. As for electing a recording secretary, the process was not as easy. If anybody wants to step forward to be the secretary. I'd like to comment on it. Sure. H having served on various committees and in, in, in boards, um, at the state level right down to the local level, I think it's rather difficult for somebody to carry out the duties of recording secretary at the same time being a participant in those discussions in, uh, in debates or whatever the business of the committee being conducted. Um, my, I guess, vote would be that we look to the outside um, uh, of the committee for that recording secretary for those very reasons. It's, it's very difficult because I've been in smaller committees where you, your participation is manda almost mandatory, which it will be here, because everybody wants to have a voice and not to be distracted by taking notes. I'll go back and I'll uh, send that out to see if there's interest to get back for our first meeting. But for the meantime, we do need to install a recording secretary because it's required, correct? Correct. I, I would say that we need a secret recording secretary anyway because someone's got to sign the minutes, right. and it's typically the secretary. Yeah. So. That person, while not do, actually doing the recording, would still be responsible for, for the minutes. Want to step up? I'll do it. I'll volunteer. And I'll make a motion to elect Russ Denver. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Russ. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Russ Denver stepped up to the plate to serve as a recording I mean, secretary point, until an outsider is appointed. Moving on, Florence introduced the idea of a commission webpage. The setup of a Charter Commission webpage, I, I, I think for communication, for um, its transparency, I, th I think it's a great thing to have. Um, and that's something that maybe I can work with our IT director and I can see uh, to set that up. Um, and, you know, for a lot of reasons, from meetings to information to status to, to, to whatever, uh, to comments, we can, uh, we can use that webpage, uh, you know, for what we, you know, for each each meeting, month by month, um, if it's uh, when the public hearing is going to be, if it's where the locations are going to be. It's it's a good place to to uh, to put information on. The committee talks marketing strategies and hopes for outside participation at their first public hearing on May 27th at 7 p.m. I think one of the things that, that was new information to me tonight, it's concerning to me, is the speed in which we have to hold the first public hearing. So to me, that is a priority um, of the committee that we actually should be setting the date and further what objectives we hope to accomplish from that, what information we hope to draw from the public. If we're going to do it, it is kind of heavy lifting, I think, to get the word out and get people 
to go, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try and get participation going. But I agree with Eric, mm -hmm. we need to get that date out there. If 13 people showed up at the first hearing the last time, and we don't get a whole lot of people because we're just getting going. Yes. All right? So you don't want to put 13 people in the high school auditorium right. yeah, and listen to them echo. Right. I agree with, you know, the intimate setting of the Council on Aging media room. Yeah. As, and I agree it's less intimidating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Chair Don Starks brings up future concerns and ideas for the committee's road ahead. First, I think we might want to get a consensus of what our basic timeline wants, needs to be, with a, whether we're shooting for the next municipal election, which is in April, because listening to what Tom says, if we go all the way to July, and I guess I'm telling you how I feel, um, then we've got between July all the way around again till April of 2017, and um, a lot can happen through that time period. and. The energy um, because we will be building up to something and then the energy could fall away and um, I'm concerned about that I know we are statutorily given five thousand dollars I think that's a great place to start um, and Larry had mentioned consultants um, there was I believe we, a consultant yes. hired mm -hmm. um, and the last Charter Commission asked for twenty thousand dollars in the thoughts that we wouldn't have to keep going back for money. Mm -hmm. This is just, I'm just throwing out food for thought here. Um, I took a look, I still have copies of the, I believe you had two <coughs> bids for um, the consultants. Right. Um, and I just was curious as to the consultant, did they actually write the bylaw for us or did they merely bring together all the material and you wrote it? He did put the final packages mm -hmm. together, obviously, with, with input from the from the commission. Right. Yeah. If I may, that might be a good agenda item for our first full meeting. Mm -hmm. That is, whether we want to engage the services of a consultant, and if we do, what is the scope of work? Because mm -hmm. in order to engage a consultant, <coughs> we have to develop a scope of work. We'll keep you posted on what the committee has in store as we cover their upcoming meeting on May 14th. Stay tuned. In other news tonight, the Townwide Mosquito Spring Initiative is underway. The town announced details of this year's program Tuesday in an automated voice message to residents as part of EL Blackboard Connect system. JBI Helicopter Services set up a camp at Center Field on Wednesday, getting ready for Thursday's application. The aerial spraying of what's called the BTI covers some 1,000 acres of the town's wetlands, which are considered to be prime breeding sites for mosquitoes. The town assures residents that the BTI is a naturally occurring soil bacterium that helps effectively kill mosquito larvae. Officials say it's what's called a biocontrol product that's non-toxic to humans, pets, or other animals according to the CDC. Mosquito-borne diseases affect millions of people each year. Diseases can afflict not only humans, but can also transmit parasites that dogs and horses are extremely susceptible to. These include heartworm, West Nile virus, and Eastern Equine Encephalitis. Anyone with questions about this year's mosquito spraying program is asked to contact the East Long Meadow Board of Health. Tonight, Elcat tries to get to the bottom of what's actually happening with the old Brown Farm property off of Hamden Road. You may recall town residents approved the purchase of the property several years ago to possibly be used as recreation space. However, the farm has sat vacant ever since. Except that is for the front section of the property. The acreage closest to Hampton Road is currently being used as a community garden. But what about the rest of the property? Recreation Director Colin Drury gives us the backstory along with upcoming plans. So I've had the opportunity to go there, walk the property, tour the property, you know, with people from the DPW, uh, just kind of checking out what it could be used for. And uh, last year, the Board of Selectmen, um, the Recreation Commission, worked for a few months trying to figure out, you know, what could be put there. You know, what should it be? What could be an overall plan? So they came together with a plan that kind of was, was a park atmosphere. So there's, you know, park benches and a splash pad for the kids, basketball courts, a baseball field, community gardens, hiking trails, things like that. So we brought that plan to the selectmen. And what they did was they asked uh, myself and Ralph Page from the planning board to create a committee. That committee was set into place. Although the Brown Farm property is still in the idea process, according to Drury, Multiple plans have been brought up for discussion. 
which he says will ultimately move the creative process further. And for the past year, we've been meeting to discuss you know, the property and those plans that were created because Ralph had also made one as well and trying to morph the two. And, um, and then we kind of started thinking what would be best and we're still thinking that park atmosphere. Uh, but what we want to do is show the citizens that we're actually working uh, to use it now. Renovating the Brown Farm property may be years in the making, but Jerry has short-term plans along with his long-term plans. We have kind of switched gears from our plans to uh, show in the next six months, can, what can we do with it? You know, can we have some special events for families? Can we um, open the uh, barn portion as a staging area for snowshoeing or cross-country skiing? Um, so, you know, things like that are in the six-month plan. Then we have the 12-month plan that we're working on. You know, what can we accomplish in a year that shows our citizens that we're using it? On April 28th, the Board of Selectmen made the committee official, appointing Heather Cunningham from the group Friends of the Brown Farm. That group, in the meantime, has its own ideas to create an outdoor riding arena in conjunction with 4-H, a plan the Selectmen approved for this summer. But Jury says the committee is looking at all options. The selectmen actually appointed an official appointed uh, committee for the Brown Farm um, and appointed myself and Ralph as co-chairs for that committee along with uh, Mrs. Cunningham, I believe, uh, from the Friends of the Brown Farm. So uh, our hope is to add a couple more members um, so we can have, you know, five, six, seven people uh, to collectively think about what is going to serve the community as a whole. The Brown Farm property, he says, has a lot of potential, but the ultimate goal is to serve the community as a whole. Um, you know, will basketball courts, a splash pad, a playground, a baseball field, a multi-purpose sport field, hiking trails, community gardens, you know, benches, a fitness trail, you know, will that serve our community as a whole, you know, along with the ability to even put on 4-H programming there. So it's, you know, what can we do to, you know, for everything? Number one, making sure we're enhancing our recreation, you know, here in our community. For more updates on the Brown Farm property, be sure to stay tuned to LCAT News. Turning into sports news now, a lot to cover from Spartans from baseball to lacrosse. Colin Casey has a Spartan sports update. Thanks, Allie and Rebecca. Along with the weather, Spartan sports have been heating up lately. The baseball team is currently on a four-game winning streak, gaining victories over Cathedral twice, Taconic, and most recently, Amherst. Senior Tyler Martinelli has batted 545 the past three games and hit a walk-off double against Amherst to give the Spartans a 5-4 victory. The number four ranked team moves on to a 6-5 overall record. Also on a winning streak is the girls lacrosse team. The 9-2 Spartans have won their last nine games and are currently at the top of their division. Senior Mary Bates became the leading scorer in girls lacrosse throughout all of Western Mass, notching an impressive 30 goals and 24 assists so far this season. Fellow teammate Lindsey Phillips also made the list at number 9 with 23 goals and 13 assists. Congratulations to both of them. After a tough loss to West Springfield last week, the Spartans softball team gained a huge victory over the undefeated number 1 Aguam team 9-7. Mackenzie Lambert led the Lady Spartans offensively, going 2-for-4 with two RBIs and a triple. Freshman Meg Sharon also picked up a couple of hits in the win. On Monday, the girls' track and field team hosted Northampton and came out on top thanks to double wins from Paige Seuss, Alexandra DeBrindisi, Elizabeth Cook, and Sierra Loomis. The girls are now 2-0 on the season as both they and the boys' team prepare for the Western Mass Tournament on May 17th. That's all for sports. Back to you guys. Thanks, Colin. Well, that will do it for us tonight. Thanks for watching LCAT News Update. I'm Rebecca Green. And I'm Allie Carrington. Until next time, good night.